Hi guys. It is a spectacularly gorgeous and I mean over the top and beautiful day. Here in the collapse of global industrial civilization on this gorgeous Monday morning, March 8th, 2021. Another Monday morning in the collapse of global industrial civilization and uh, we got the squirrely building a nest right outside. Little squirrel doll. Looking for those squirrelies. Uh, so anyway, I was combing through the mainstream media news this Monday morning before even getting out of bed, you know, listening, well, reading articles about how two-thirds of the tropical forests on this planet have been, you know, just destroyed and bulldozed and burned. Uh, then this long article about how the boreal forest <coughs> is being bulldozed and uh, obliterated and burned and stuff. And, uh, oh boy. Anyway, so I just hit the wall about the, you know, the ecological collapse of a planet and went over here to counterpunch seeing what's on the minds of those lefties over at Counterpunch, and I uh, stumbled on this story, and, uh, you know, I just thought that while I'm spending all of this time chronicling the collapse of a planet, I'm not paying enough attention to what's going on, on probably, as Book Hermit uh, would say, uh, the most likely way this whole shit show is coming down, uh, and that is war. So, this is an article, uh, I'm going to let you down, little guy, again, on Counterpunch. I'm going to put the link to it. You can read this long article yourself, but if you just want to sit around and listen to your old chronicler of the collapse, read it for you, I'll be happy to do that. And this is uh, by a fellow named Paul Atwood. Paul Atwood is the author of War and Empire, The American Way of Life. That, that sums up the American way of life, War and Empire. So uh, today, this long essay and. Uh, Counterpunch. Paul just gets right to the point as we title this story Full Spectrum Extinction. Full Spectrum Extinction. Take it away, Paul, and explain uh, probably as good a way as any as we're going to send ourselves to oblivion. <clears throat> Last week, General Todd Walder, top gun of the U.S. European Command, declared that, quote, Russia remains an enduring existential threat to the United States and our European allies, close quote. On February 23rd, President Biden's choice for Central Intelligence Director Williams, William Burns testified that, quote, adversarial predatory Chinese leadership poses our biggest geopolitical test. Outcompeting China will be key to our national security in the days ahead, requiring intensified focus and urgency, close quote. Newly minted, newly minted Secretary of Defense Former four-star General Lloyd Austin chimed in that China posed the, quote, most significant threat, close quote, to the U.S. military. Well, which malicious adversary is it? Will the Putinoids shortly sink the next American vessel to transit the Black or Barents Sea? Are the ever more malevolent Chinese aiming their new supersonic missile ship killers at the next U.S. carrier to transit the Straits of Taiwan? 
the Pentagon, now we're getting back to our own country, the, the Pentagon's push for what they call, quote, full spectrum dominance was extolled in the 1990s and it has proceeded at full speed. Peace President, <coughs> I'm sure he's saying that with a note of irony, Peace President Obama, having won the Nobel Prize before doing anything peaceable, soon asserted his, quote, pivot to the East in fear of growing Chinese economic and military power. He also, this is Obama, also initiated the $1 trillion nuclear expansion program, stage managed the bombing and destruction of Libya, <clears throat> and armed the Saudi war in Yemen. Trump may have come close to nuclear war with North Korea, but that issue is still on the burner. Not long ago, the Pentagon called for a $100 billion development of missiles better able to carry and target nuclear weapons. <clears throat> Just last week, the U.S. Air Force dispatched B-1 bombers to Norway that now overfly the Russian base in the Baltic and earlier deployed combat marine units there as well. Recall that American armed forces are now stationed along Russia's very borders and the NATO alliance has essentially encircled Russia and now keens that it must urgently confront the Chinese peril. <clears throat> it is estimated that the United States spends 40% of the global total devoted to arms purchases. The real military budget is far in excess of these official figures given numerous secret projects off limits to congressional inquiry or oversight. Washington easily outspends Russia and China combined. What evidence exists that these two adversaries plan any military action against the U.S.? While we are at it, let's consider the fact that no enemy has invaded the U.S. since 1812, nor is it possible for any country to do so. So, what is the threat? Why are the national security mandarins fixated on military threats? What else could their deliberate employment of the term existential mean especially when their response is to mount and deploy more military hardware to the national boundaries of the antagonist they cultivate. <clears throat> Russia has sought to dominate its respective sphere for a millennium and China for at least four millennia both without any indication they are intent on military global dominance. The U.S. has been doing the same in the Western Hemisphere by contrast for, lo for slightly more than two centuries and like a punk adolescent now believes itself to be the toughest guy on the geopolitical block. The fact is that neither U.S. opponents threaten the U.S. They don't station troops on the Mexican border or sail their flights within sight of Guantanamo or build bases and station troops all over the planet. Primarily, they oppose <clears throat> the declared American agenda of global dominance economically and politically and they certainly are rapidly developing their own capacities for military response 
to the threat they perceive from the U.S. They do arm and support their own allies, as so does Washington, and far more of them. The only real existen existential jeopardies to Americans and the rest of the world are the proliferated nukes and from climate change and the stream of critical emergencies for all societies that are sure to ensue, and the intergroup violence that will exacerbate national paranoias and provide fuel for more war. The current Pentagon call for improved nuclear missiles should illuminate but woefully does not the very authentic existential menace that imperils us more critically by the hour. That is the bulletin of the atomic scientist is to be taken seriously, but who pays attention to them? Where are we? Aren't they ready to reset the doomsday clock? I where are we? I think we're a minute and 40 seconds to doomsday, according to the Bulletin for Atomic Scientists. We'll have to check in with that. Someone check in. Where are we on the doomsday clock? <clears throat> Obviously, neither Russia nor China are innocent of crimes against other peoples, but crucially for our collective future is full acknowledgement that neither is the United States. The American public education system writ large teaches most students that their government has been opposed to both Russia and China for the last century because their communist or otherwise totalitarian system deprives their citizens of the freedoms and rights Americans value most and has always posed threats to the American way of life. How many pupils have ever learned of the military incursion ordered by President Wilson in tandem with Britain and Japan into Russia in 1918 in hope of strangling the communist infant in its cradle? Had Russian troops ever been on U.S. soil, youngsters would learn that fact on the first day of first grade. How many learn of the incursions of American forces in China at the dawn of the 20th century to throttle a Chinese rebellion against ever-increasing Western occupation of their land? How many become aware that the U.S. threatened to nuke China during the Korean War? Why should we be surprised that both nations have employed their resources to attempt to match and contest the threats they feel from the U.S.? Flashback to 1940. FDR, the president of the neutral U.S. orders covert naval actions in the North Atlantic in support of the British war against the Nazis. He anticipates that if an American vessel is attacked or sunk, the outrage will tip the public toward acceptance of war. Earlier, he has deployed the Pacific Fleet to Hawaii knowing full well that Japan will see this as a threat to the empire it is building in East Asia and so demands its withdrawal from China or else and embargoes Japanese oil and steel, certain that the land of the rising sun will be forced to seek the indispensable fuel and other resources in the Dutch East Indies and French Indochina. You know, we're talking about Vietnam here. 
<clears throat> these measures are intended to provoke war sooner or, la sooner or later he avers the Japanese will make a move that will lead to war. I'm guessing that's the quote uh, from FDR. In fact, American cryptographers have broken large parts of Japanese secret ciphers and know that Japan has decided on war. Key figures, this is still 1940, key figures in the U.S. government have prior knowledge of the attack to come at Pearl Harbor. On November 25th, FDR tells his top advisors that we are, quote, likely to be attacked as soon as next Monday, close quote. On December 6th, the last coded transmission to co to transmission to Tokyo by Japanese spies reads, all clear, no barrage balloons, air defenses are up. There is an opportunity for a surprise attack against these places, close quote. That same evening before the attack at Pearl Harbor, Roosevelt tells his closest aide, quote, this means war, no cl close quote. No warning of imminent assault is sent to commanders in Hawaii. The sacrifices of more than 2,000 American lives and subsequently another 400,000 will be the price of entry into World War II and the consequent prize of American ascendancy. Of course, at the war's outset, no American planner believed the entire planet was in existential danger, and they also were positive that the U.S. would not suffer the invasions or aerial bombings faced by all the other belligerents. The real reason the U.S. decided on war all blather about human rights and democracy to the contrary involved the danger to the American economy in a world shut off to American capital penetration at the moment then of the world's most critical economic slump. You know, this is using war to get out of a depression. The minor measures of social democracy enacted throughout the Great Depression had failed, so war production was the answer. The Third Reich and Japan posed every probability of creating autarkic, I don't know what the word, autarkic zones that would all but shut out American access to markets, resources, and cheap labor. Labor. The Soviet Union had already done too much of that, and since the late 19th century, the U.S. had visualized the great China market. Japan's takeover of East Asia precluded that blueprint and threatened to forestall the American century. Well, we know the outcome. Although Japan was seeking surrender so long as the emperor would not be tried as a war criminal, Hiroshima and Nagasaki were vaporized anyway. FDR had condemned the deliberate targeting of civilians by the other belligerents before the U.S. entered the war, but that was then. What the Brits call the great game of empire proceeds apace. Americans certainly learned little from the most dangerous conflict in their species history, soon to follow Korea, Vietnam, Central America, Iraq, Afghanistan, Yemen, 
and many others all now all but forgotten. Daniel Ellsberg, in an interview with The Real News two years ago, asserted that it was not the Allied bombing campaign over Germany that thwarted Nazi development of the atomic bomb, but starting, starting startlingly that Hitler himself ordered the nascent project to be dropped. Why? Because Adolf Hitler grasped the essential fact that the development of such weapons, what Ellsberg calls the doomsday machine writ large, would lead to all-out nuclear war and the cessation of the human experiment on our planet and necessarily his plans for the Third Reich. Apparently Hitler was still naive enough to think another emerging power would not initiate the preparations for the final day of reckoning, soon to be followed by nine other players, more than enough nukes to accomplish the mission. These questions beg the real issues which are that both Russia and China are, are much the same economic and power obstacles to the liberal world order that Germany and Japan did Washington has always claimed to desire and promote, but which serves as camouflage and decoy for the real ambition, which, to repeat, is full spectrum dominance, a fool's errand if ever there was one. There is nothing humane or liberal about the global order the U.S. desires since the term is proclaimed to mean that democracy and human rights and free trade are the paramount values at stake. Tell that to a long list of those who have been favored with America's paternal care since 1945, wherein the total number of deaths are in the millions. As for existential threat, the only real such hazard is the increasing probability that the mounting proper preparations for conflict in the immediate sphere of our enemies will result in some spark that will trigger all-out war and escalation to species extinction. The geopolitical adolescents who viewed who wield the power in our country are consumed with its arrogance and all but negate the authentic existential millstone that hangs weightier by the day. Since our leaders learned nothing from the Cuban Missile Crisis and many other near misses like the Abel Archer War Game of 1983, ought to be surprised that neither have the mass of the American people. That truly existential crisis is now all but forgotten. Few of my undergrads can speak accurately of it, and more than a few have never even heard of it. I still carry the sense of dread I felt as a 15-year-old during those 13 days in October 1962. I recall the words of then Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara that he went to bed on the last night of the crisis fearing that he and we would not live to see the dawn. Members of the defense establishment do know something of the extreme and awesome power they wield. As even former U.S. Secretary of Defense William Perry warns, we are far 
closer to a nuclear holocaust than ever do we stand at the brink of full spectrum destruction? Well, I guess we'll find out the answer to that question soon enough. Thank you, uh, Paul Atwood. And if you want more to hear more of what uh, Paul has to say about what is really going on <clears throat> between the fear-mongering mainstream media headlines, check out his book, War and Empire, The American Way of Life. War and Empire, The American Way of Life. But uh, I've got to wrap up today's Chronicle of the Collapse and get out there and uh, maybe I will actually... Uh, Maybe I will actually get some petunias planted here in the collapse of global industrial civilization as long as we have petunias. And of course, homegrown tomatoes, there is still hopium. Get out there and plant your petunias while you still can. Bye, guys.